Okay, let's get started. So good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to you uh, from wherever, whichever part of the world you're joining from. I hope all of you are staying healthy and safe uh, during this time. Uh, my name is Praveen. Uh, I lead marketing at BrowserStack, and I'm really, really excited uh, to see this great turnout, and I'm very happy to launch the BrowserStack Summer of Learning program. Uh, you know, the goal with, with the Summer of Learning program is really to help you, uh, you know, build great software and help you sort of take your testing skills to the next level, right? So we're, we're going to start with the basics, which is what uh, Charlie and David are going to cover today, uh, which is, you know, getting started with Selenium. Uh, but we're going to gradually sort of increase uh, and, and then sort of, you know, delve into more and more complex topics when it comes to testing and test automation, right? So from starting with Selenium, to getting started with CI, CD pipelines, scaling up your test suites, and how to think about mobile testing. Uh, it's a five-part series. Uh, it's gonna be happening every Friday during the month of May. I'm really happy to see such a great turnout today. So thank you all for attending. Uh, we'll get started uh, we'll get started soon uh, i think just before we begin a few housekeeping pointers uh, we are recording this webinar uh, and we will be sharing the link uh, with with all of you uh, once the webinar is over uh, we will also be saving about 15 minutes by, during the end of the webinar for any q a so uh, please feel free to use the q a button uh, in the zoom interface to raise your questions and uh, we'll save 15 minutes towards the end where i will uh, sort of direct these questions towards charlie and david all right, great. So with that out of the way, uh, I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes introducing you to BrowserStack, uh, telling you a little bit about us and uh, our products. So BrowserStack started nine years ago, uh, and uh, you know our co-founders Ritesh and Nakul literally started it uh, working out of a coffee shop. And you know their goal, uh, you know they were developers, and and their goal with starting BrowserStack was to solve one problem, which was how do I how do I test my website on Internet Explorer? Right? They were developing on a Mac, and they did not have access to uh, the IE browser. And that's how we started, right? Um, and uh, that was the only problem we were solving back then. And uh, within six months, we had a thousand paying customers. And now, nine years later, uh, we have three offices, 400 plus employees, uh, and uh, you know we've got a platform now of 2,000 plus browsers and devices, and 25,000 plus customers, uh, right? Uh, we have uh, customers from uh, you know all the different sort of uh, sectors and verticals that you can think about from finance and insurance and technology. Uh, and uh, we also sort of, uh, you know, are powering some of the leading open source projects on the internet, right? So jQuery, uh, Angular, Ember, these are all, uh, you know, huge open source projects that use the BrowStack platform uh, to test their projects. Uh, we also power some of the largest cloud providers uh, on the internet, right? So these, use, uh, these cloud providers use BrowStack to test their platforms. And to test their websites. Uh, to tell you a little bit about our scale, we have two million plus registered users. Uh, you know, users run 72 billion Selenium commands on our platform every year. Uh, we have customers in over 135 countries, and uh, we have 10 globally distributed data centers around the world. Let me talk a little bit about our products. So we have four key products. Uh, split between browser testing and, uh, or sorry, web web-based testing and uh, mobile app testing, right? So the first product is Automate. Uh, Automate is basically our Selenium grid on the cloud and uh, allows agile teams to test uh, quality at scale to test their software on our 2000 plus browsers and real mobile devices using Selenium. Uh, we have Live, which is our interactive uh, cross-browser testing tool. So you can use this to run your manual tests, run your smoke tests right before you launch into production. Uh, it is browser-based and you can actually load your website on uh, the 2000 plus browsers and devices that we have on our platform. We have App Automate, which is used for automated mobile app testing. So you can actually uh, test your native mobile apps uh, using a variety of frameworks. We support uh, Appium, Espresso, Earl Grey, and XUI uh, to run your uh, mobile app uh, automated tests. And the last one is App Live, which is uh, you know, which allows you to test your native uh, mobile apps. Uh, again, uh, run your manual tests, run your smoke tests, um, actually load your app on real mobile devices and uh, make sure that it's working correctly. Okay, so that's just a quick introduction about our products. Now I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes introducing you to our main speakers today. Uh, the first is uh, David Burns, also known as the Automated Tester. 
David heads the open source team at BrowserStack. Uh, many of you might have already heard of him. Uh, he's he's a Selenium core contributor, uh, and he also contributes to the WebDriver specification. Uh, and he's uh, the chair of the Browser Testing and Tools Working Group. Uh, the second speaker today is Charlie Lee. Uh, Charlie has been uh, you know with BrowserStack for many years now, uh, and he manages the global solutions engineering team across our three offices, San Francisco, Dublin, and Mumbai. Uh, and Charlie has been helping uh, customers uh, with their automated sort of testing journey and uh, you know, the software sort of quality journey over the last few years, uh, you know, helping uh, sort of large enterprises put in place uh, impl and implement automation. So these are uh, the experts that are gonna be talking about Selenium today and getting started. So I'm gonna hand it over now to David to take over. Over to you, David. Thanks, Praveen. Um, that was really a uh, nice intro. Um, hi, everyone. So today I'm going to uh, first start by uh, just sharing my screen and hopefully this is going to work perfectly. All right. Um, and then I will go on to presentation. So hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, so uh, what we're going to start with today is just a brief overview on what automation is and what Selenium is. Um, from there, we'll move uh, into starting a browser um, and the ergonomics that goes into that, um, finding elements to interact with, because if we're doing automation, we need to do that, um, actually interacting with it. Uh, and then Charlie will take us through building a test, uh, building through a suite, uh, looking at how we can expand uh, into multiple browsers and kind of talk about that. And hopefully we'll then finish off with a Q&A section at the end. Um, as Praveen mentioned earlier, please do use the Q&A uh, functionality within Zoom. Um, those questions will be collected at the end um, and then we'll get, we'll try our best to answer as many as we can uh, in the time that we have. Um, So what is automation? Um, in this case, a, a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today is about test automation. Um, when people um, are testing their websites and testing their uh, web David's, applications. Oops. Sorry to interrupt. I think I'm just seeing a few folks saying they're unable to see your screen. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I'm not so sure if I why shared the wrong. Let me no, see. No, I'm I able to see. I was able to see the slide deck. So maybe you just want to start and stop again the screen share. Yeah. Just check. Let's just try again. Uh, oh, I, what have I done? Let's open that up. Anyway, and let's try it there. I do apologize to everyone. Is that better for everyone? Yeah, I, I can see coming it. Up? I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I t actually, um, I. Let me start this again, because uh, what I would prefer to do is share my desktop, uh, because I'm going to go between different things uh, and see if I share that. Is that still sh viewable to people? Um, if not, I will kind of just pop out. Um, no, I think that's fine, David. I can see it. We can see it. OK, brilliant. Um, I do apologize to everyone. Um, sometimes these things go a bit haywire. Um, Cool. Uh, oh, right. Uh, so uh, as I was mentioning, we're talking about uh, test automation. And in this case, we're wanting to see how we can write um, tests or checks, depending on who you speak to in the industry, about making like creating user scenarios that are programmatic, that allow us to check uh, that our website is working correctly. Uh, and this is fairly simple uh, because we're going to try use Selenium uh, and Selenium is kind of was for a very long time a de facto standard in web automation is now a, um, a real uh, standard um, and that was work that I did with Simon Stewart that allows us to do this. Um, and Selenium was originally created by uh, Jason Huggins and their, he, his idea is that he was trying to test IE and Firefox at the same time uh, when he was working at ThoughtWorks. Um, and what the reason why he created it were, like, was to get through this. Um, and a lot of pe what people were doing at the time were they, they were using a, a tool called uh, 
Mercury test runner, uh, or wooden runner, oh, sorry. Um, and the, like, the reason why selenium was chosen is that this is, you give people selenium when they have mercury poisoning. So that's where the original came from, a name came from, um, and it's just stuck. And it's quite a good name. Um, some people pronounce it selenium, I pronounce it selenium. Um, it's uh, each to their own. I kind of laugh at it as kind of a tomato, tomato moment. Um, so let's start diving into um, what this actually looks like when we start writing tests. Um, so programmatically, um, I'm going to be using Python. Uh, Python's kind of my favorite language to write in, um, but um, Charlie later on will get into all the different languages that you can use uh, with Selenium. Uh, but a lot of my examples um, will be in Python and when we, um, after after each episode, any examples will be going onto our GitHub repository so that you can start using them. Um, so from here, uh, I've, like, I've got the Selenium uh, and WebDriver uh, libraries and modules, Python modules that people can start using. Uh, Python, you have, like in Java and everyone else, you have to import libraries that you need to use. Um, the first step that I'm going to do uh, is where it's got browser equals webdriver.firefox is that I need a browser to actually interact with. Uh, and what this does is that it will do a lot of the heavy lifting. It looks like a very simple bit of code, uh, but in that very simple bit of code, it starts up a browser, make sure that everything's ready for you uh, and that the browser is in a fit state to work with. Um, then the next line uh, is that it uh, tries to get a web page. Um, so the, it's normally picked from that. Uh, it's picked from, it, like it uses get mostly because like you get a web page or you post it and it's using like HTTP uh, verbs. So I'm gonna um, move to uh, a quick example uh, so that you can see it running. Uh, I'm a big fan of kind of showing people thing uh, code running. Um, so if we do a quick clear, um, this is pretty much the same code that I had up uh, on the slide. Um, I hope everyone can see this. Uh, and we're going to just... Hey, um, David, sorry. Uh, just a yeah. quick one. Can we just pause one second? I'm just still getting some comments about people not able to see. Um, oh, dear. I'm not sure why this is happening. Um, yeah, I think it's fine. Keep going. Yeah, I think it's just maybe an uh, intermittent issue for a few folks. Okay. Keep going. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, folks, if my uh, internet is kind of playing up. Um, but uh, do remember, it will be recorded for everyone to see later on. Um, so we've got a, a, our imports at the top. Uh, this one will be using a uh, future example. Uh, and here we start up Firefox and I've got a local uh, page uh, that I'm going to navigate to um, and we're going to try see how that goes. And so in this case, I'm just, um, because I'm using Python, um, I also have a, my favorite Python test runner is one called PyTest. Uh, and so to easily run it, uh, I would just go PyTest um, episode one, and we want an example test. Um, and it, what this is going to do is that it's going to start up the browser and navigate to that page, and it's going to stop um, and act like it's finished. Um, so let's see how that goes. And there we are, really simple. We've got a page, it's been navigated to. Um, I wanted to go to polls, but uh, it requires me to log in first. So we're gonna have to uh, see how we can extend our test uh, to start doing that. Uh, so we go back to our slides. Um, we're gonna have to start, we're gonna have to find an element. And so uh, we'll, We'll have a look at that 
the browser that it, I got to leave, that I left open, um, and we need to find in find the logon page, uh, logon I element. Um, fortunately, um, here's an example that I've done before. Uh, we just need to go browser, find the elements on the page. Um, we are going to use the by object that you saw before, uh, and this the by object will allow us to do multiple star, uh, different types of searches. So um, if you look at HTML, and so if I go to the page that we started up that is under control, um, I'll just zoom this in a bit. And if I right click and inspect an element, I'll zoom that up a bit. Uh, we can have ID equals username. Um, and so that is the ID um, that we have in our test. Um, its value is username so that when we search, it's going to look for that input um, and allow us to interact with it. So that's fairly simple. Um, if I go back to my uh, editor, um, I can do things like, uh, we'll call it login because that's what we're going to work with. Um, we have browser, so that's our web driver object. We're going to find an element. We're going to do buy. Um, and if you see here, there's a, a list of items. So we have class name, we have CSS selector, ID, link text, name, uh, partial link text. So if you only want part of the text from a link, uh, tag name. So if you wanted to search for an input, you could just go find me a tag by tag name and put inputs. Or oh, if you wanted to do complex queries um, over the HTML, you could do something like XPath um, to find the elements. But because our example is fairly simple, we're just going to use by ID. Uh, and we want this username. So we just copy paste, um, and we can start running, we could run our test again. Now, if an element is not found when it, uh, if we were to run it, uh, so in this case, I could close this browser, don't need it anymore, because we're about to start another one. Um, we can just run our test. Uh, if it does, if it can't find that element, it's going to raise an error. If it does find it, um, everything should finish quite happily. So let's run that quickly. And let's go back to the editor. Everything worked. Hooray. Uh, cool. So we've got this. Um, and the next thing that we need to do is interact with this element. So we found it, and we need to interact with it. Um, Fortunately, there are APIs um, in WebDriver that allow us to do this. In this case, we, we want to send keys, um, keystrokes, over to the dem, uh, to the website. Um, the keys will be emulating a US keyboard um, for the most part. Uh, so if you work, uh, if your kind of your native language is something that is, uh, would invoke a, an IME keyboard, so kind of Japanese or that, um, it won't invoke the, that keyboard, um, but you are able to send over Unicode characters um, to send to the, uh, into the system, and it, it, it should just work. Um, so in this case, we're going to send over a BS demo uh, and see how that works. So in our case, we've got our login. We found it. Uh, login dot send keys. We're going to type in BS demo. So we don't need that browser anymore. And we don't need that browser anymore. Um, and we just go ahead and run it. Oh, dear. 
this is where I've done something wrong. Oh no. Uh, Oh, not sure why that hasn't passed, but th in this case, uh, we should be able to just send it, uh, send through examples um, to kind of, to what we need. Uh, we could change that to login. Maybe that's what it was. Um, I had this working just before. Unfortunately, I seem to have fallen foul of the demo gods. Uh, so I do apologize. Oh. Uh, anyway, uh, so I've done something wrong. I do apologize, but uh, in this case, uh, we have an example of if you don't find an element on the page, um, but uh, this should allow us to send something through. We're also able to do uh, something like login dot click uh, and build up any other interactions that we want to do. So go back to our slides. Um, and from here, I'm going to hand you over to Charlie, who will talk you through uh, building your suites and other sections. All right. Thank you, David. <clears throat> so um, now that we've seen how you can use Selenium to automate interactions on the page, uh, you can begin using it to develop your actual test cases for your website. Um, now, if you have a very simple website, you know, or page like we just saw with David's where we just had a few, you know, login uh, fields, one single Selenium script is going to work fine for that. But um, as you have more complicated sites, uh, you know, you might have more functionalities that you need to test um, beyond just a single login flow. And so when you do that and you have a series of, of tests all collected, we call that a suite. So uh, in this section, I'm going to walk you through some things to consider as you start building out your suite and ways that you can uh, ensure you effectively do it from the beginning so that you don't run into issues in a month or six months or a year from now, and you're able to use Selenium uh, effectively long term. So first thing you want to look at is uh, choosing a language. Um, so if you are new to uh, to automated testing and you don't have a coding background, or even if you do and new to automated testing, the first thing you'll need to do is establish what you're going to be writing in. Um, David just showed us a Python example, uh, but Python is just one of a few options. Um, the biggest things I would consider when you are writing tests is going to be dependent on A, who is writing the tests, and B, what do they know. Um, <clears throat> if you do have someone who's coming in from a development or front end background, or they've already done some, some coding in the past. Uh, let's try to make use of whatever expertise they already have. And then if you're coming in fresh without, you know, straight from manual testing, or you're not as familiar with coding itself, uh, we'll want to find something that's a little bit more suited towards uh, a beginner or newcomer. So uh, I'd say that the, of, our, of the of browser text customers, we typically see uh, five languages more than any others. Uh, Java, C Sharp, Python, Node, uh, Node JavaScript, and Ruby. Um, all of them great languages, and they all have sort of uh, pluses and minuses. Um, so you just need to find the one that works best for you. Um, just real quickly, uh, Java is extremely well established, um, very high performance. It's been around for a long time and is uh, very heavily used among companies with large automation um, suites or development processes that go back you know, years. Um, however, it's a little bit trickier to get started with um, if you're new to coding. Uh, C Sharp uh, is great if you're in the Windows or .NET uh, ecosystem. Um, it's developed by Windows. It's, it's a really great, uh, it fits in very well. And if you're already using um, Visual Studio, it's you know, designed for that. Uh, Python, like David just showed us, is a great language um, generally. Um, and particularly good if you're new to coding altogether. Um, it's easy to it's easy to pick up, it's easy to read, and there's an excellent online community to answer questions or to develop um, you know, solutions to any challenges you might face. Great Python community online. 
Uh, Node.js is really rising in popularity right now. Um, if you do have, if you're coming from any kind of front end background um, or any kind of on page JavaScript, that'll be an easy switch. Um, with Node.js, it is very highly customizable, customizable, and you can do anything in the world with, uh, with, with Node, um, but it can be a little bit quirky. Uh, it does have a few additional features, um, you know, like asynchronous uh, running. Um, so it can be a little bit difficult to master if you're new to a development. And then lastly is my personal favorite, Ruby. Um, you know, it's very similar to Python. Uh, it's sim very simple, very easy to read. Um, it does execute a little bit slower, but you know, I think it's great. It's what I learned on when I first learned uh, web development. So I'm, I'm very partial to that. But anyways, once you've selected whatever you want to, whatever language you're going to be using, uh, the next thing I definitely would recommend doing is uh, looking at a framework. So um, again, David's example, we saw just a very simple script that just had you know, a few lines of code um, importing in uh, the Selenium library and then starting a browser, finding an element, sending keys to that element. And that was pretty much it. Uh, or something that small, you just need one simple script and that'll work great. Uh, but if you do have a more robust website with more functionalities and you want to be able to test different functionalities independently of each other, uh, you'll want to use um, a framework to help keep that organized. So what a framework will do is provide a general structure uh, for you to organize all of your uh, test scripts um, and make sure everything's aligned properly. Um, so it's very beneficial, especially if you have a large scale, because you can start to track each test case individually um, and be able to have a single organizing structure around them. Um, when I say organization, what does that mean? Uh, well, it, with a framework, you can do some, some features like uh, have consistent library imports across all of your tests. Uh, you can standardize your reporting, um, like frameworks will actually have built in reporting options. So when your test finishes running, uh, it will tell you here's what tests uh, passed, here's which ones failed, uh, here's you know, where in the script it failed at. Um, you can actually put logic into the frameworks and many of them come with this logic embedded to parallelize your tests. So if you do have a hundred or a thousand tests, rather than running them one at a time and taking a very long time to finish, uh, you can start to run you know, multiple tests simultaneously. And you know, so rather than running a hundred tests one after the other, uh, you can run and 10 different uh, parallelizations. So you have you know, 10 tests running at a time and the total time finish will you know, be reduced by 90%. Um, and then lastly, uh, a framework, certain frameworks do provide some abstraction as well um, that make your code a little bit easier to read and a little bit more intuitive if someone's coming into it cold. Um, this is more common in the uh, frameworks um, that are designed to be easy to read uh, so a lot of the Node.js frameworks or some of the other uh, BDD um, aspects, which we can talk about. <laughs> um, but so an abstraction might be um, an option or you know, something else with the page object model. Uh, you might be able to say, whenever I'm going to log into my website, I know I need to find the login uh, field and or the username field and the password field, and I need to click submit. So I have to do that's what six or seven lines of code that you have to repeat multiple times throughout many different scripts. Um, using a framework uh, will actually let you uh, bundle all that together into a single action. Um, so rather than having to do all six or seven of those things, you can just say log in, and then that login um, action will then complete all of those individual components. Um, that way, if you are looking at your test a little bit later on, it becomes very apparent what you're doing. You're not looking at the raw Selenium code. You're one step uh, abstracted from it, and you just see the end result of, of, the, of the test, and it becomes more aligned to what you need the test to do rather than what the code needs to look like. Um, just some quick examples, uh, because if you are, again, new to automation, uh, the idea of a framework, you, know, you may not know where to start. Um, these are just some frameworks we do see very frequently. Um, <clears throat> many of them are, are language specific, um, but with Java, you know, test and G or J units, um, and unit spec flow for C, C sharp, uh, uh, David mentioned earlier, he was using PyTest with Python, which is why we had a little green dot appear when the test finished. A uh, web driver IO in Node.js is, um, a really is a very hot, um, framework right now with a lot of built-in functionality. 
and then Ruby has a few other options. Um, I've also included Cucumber as well, uh, which can work on any different language and is a BDD framework or behavior driven development framework uh, that actually lets you write your tests um, and include an English or a, like an a English spoken language a description for each different test. Uh, so you can actually start to collaborate between, you know, the automated testers and the manual testers. So you can have everything in one format and keep your testing consistent across all of your different teams. Um, <clears throat> but then, you know, whichever, for each of these frameworks, we do have examples on the browser stack site, which we're more than happy to, uh, to send out to you. Um, but then whenever you are picking one of these, oh, sorry, real quick. Sorry. Uh, when, whenever you are picking one, yeah, the big things to keep in mind are going to be uh, the supported language. You know, what do you want to test in? And then, you know, who's going to be using it? Um, either who's going to be contributing to it, such as with a cucumber example, or, um, you know, the test results, are they going to developers? Are they going to design people or marketing? Uh, so you want to pick one that has the right reporting output as well. Okay. And then <clears throat> once you have, you know, a simple setup going and you're able to run uh, the simple functionality, again, like the same login example we saw earlier, um, you may realize that your website has some more advanced uh, functionality that requires, um, you know, more advanced inputs than just the, uh, you know, find an element, click on it, send text to it, things like that. Uh, so these are some of the more advanced things you can do with Selenium. Um, you know, the Actions API let you send, you know, commands or actions to the driver that aren't tied to an element. Um, you know, like refresh a page or something like that. Uh, the web driver waits um, <clears throat> allow you to start timing and synchronizing your Selenium scripts to align to your web page. Uh, so maybe you do have an option where you click a button and some action happens that usually takes three or four seconds. Um, you can actually tell the script to wait for that period of time or to wait until a condition changes on the page before taking the next action. Uh, this just ensures a little bit more stability in your test so it doesn't attempt to move too quickly for itself. And there are a few different options, implicit, explicit, fluent. Um, you know, the exact uh, benefits of each of those is gonna vary. Um, uh, but you know, that's you know, certainly a more advanced feature. Uh, the JavaScript executor is um, you know, very commonly used, which actually lets you uh, take Selenium and inject JavaScript directly into the page and execute it uh, there. Um, so if you have any kind of single page applications um, where you want to trigger a specific event that's not triggerable via the UI, uh, this is a great way to do that. Um, additionally, uh, you, know, you can take and save screenshots locally. Uh, if you're doing any kind of visual regression, this is a, a great way to do that, or any kind of visual testing. Uh, you can use Selenium to open up a page, take a screenshot, save it locally, move on to the next page, take a screenshot of that one, and develop a you know, good bank of screenshots that you can use either for comparison's sake or to, you know, just to verify that things are happening. Um, and Slime does make that really, really easy to do. Uh, so you don't have to go in there and manually screenshot it yourself. Uh, <clears throat> recently, we've seen um, inst instances where a page has a pop-up that's technically not part of the website. So you couldn't use, you know, HTML uh, selectors or CSS selectors to interact with it because it's part of the browser. And Selenium actually lets you handle or you know, accept or dismiss those automatically. Uh, you might need to switch between multiple different tabs in your browser um, or an iframe versus the base page. That'd be a window handle. Um, and then the last thing that gets into a, you know, some really cool functionality is the Selenium grid. Um, and so we saw earlier in David's example that he was able to run his, you know, his script uh, locally and it would spin up a uh, Firefox browser in his own computer. So he was actually seeing that on his laptop. Um, that was, was great, but there are some scale limitations to doing that. Um, obviously, if you try to launch up 100 different Firefox browsers at once, uh, your computer might start to slow down, maybe not have a CPU to handle that. Or maybe you need to test on a browser that's not supported on your computer. Maybe you don't have Internet Explorer or Edge installed since you're using Mac. Um, in that case, you'll have to connect to some other machine in order to test on it. Um, and that's what Selenium Grid can do for you. Uh, so in this case, rather than having it open up the browser in your own window or in your own computer, uh, you'll connect to a different computer that also has Selenium on it. 
and then your browser will open up on that other computer over there. Um, the big advantage, obviously, you can have other browsers that aren't on your computer available over there. You can connect up to multiple different uh, remote machines. So if you want to run 100 at a time, rather than having to run them all on a single instance or a single computer, you can connect to 100 different machines and run one in each of those. That way, each test can continue running you know, independently. Um, or let's say you have a distributed team, or you've got some consistency or consolidation across your entire organization. Um, you can have one infrastructure you set up and then everyone in the company or everyone on your, on your team can connect to it remotely and you aren't uh, restricted or dealing with, you know, oh, well, it works on my computer, but not his. You won't be dealing with that scenario. Um, you'll have consistency across all of your different users. So Selenium Grid is a really powerful thing, especially as you start scaling up your tests. Um, and it is a great um, benefit when you start dealing with the need for cross-browser testing. So <clears throat> with the multiple browsers, um, this gets at the heart of cross-browser testing, again, which is a, a big browser stack uh, feature. Um, over the past 20 years, uh, the number of browsers that are available has really grown a lot. Um, there, are the, there have been changes to which the officially supported browsers, you know, things like um, Internet Explorer versus Safari, uh, but we've also seen a rise in open source browsers, you know, Firefox, thanks David, and um, you know, Google Chrome and Opera and a few others. Um, and so that's happened in the last 20 years. And then in the last 10, we've seen the same thing happen with devices where people are starting to use browsers on um, devices with different operating systems, uh, different screen resolutions, different screen sizes, different hardware components. Um, and so there's been a lot more there have been a, an increased number of ways for people to actually access your website, which makes it harder to ensure your site actually works properly for each of them. So to give you an example of how a website might behave differently on different browsers, we have this uh, magical div, um, which was found by Martin Cuppins um, a few years ago, and he uh, published it on Twitter. Um, but this uh, div, um, HTML element with this CSS, uh, renders extremely differently across those five big desktop browsers. So this exact same div, if you load it up in Chrome versus Safari versus IE, it's going to display like this, and there's no consistency. Um, so if you do have, you know, even if your site is, you know, you think it works properly on all the different browsers, it is important to check because as soon as CSS gets beyond just simple colors, um, you you might run into a scenario like this. And this is a superficial example. Um, or not superficial, but it's a formatting example. There are ways for um, your functional, your, your website's functions to actually behave differently as well. Uh, so different browsers are gonna have different web APIs uh, that you might hook into, all of which might be supported or not supported depending on which browser you're actually running into, or which, you're, which browser you're running your website on or accessing it from. Um, and then to add one other layer, um, of complexity to this general fragmentation is especially with the uh, open source browsers, they've started to get updated very, very regularly. Um, so in addition to just having uh, Firefox and Chrome and IE or Edge, um, they're now starting to get updated on a regular basis. Firefox and Chrome and now Edge are being updated on a monthly basis. So every single month there is a new version available and not everyone is good about updating that. Um, I know I'm certainly not the best of it. I always have Chrome giving me that uh, red arrow or icon in the corner telling me I need to update it. But with you know, new releases come new possibilities for, you know, for, er for errors. They might introduce new web APIs or modifications that break what was working. Um, and staying on top of you know, a different browser or at least three different browsers every single month suddenly turns into a lot to deal with. Um, so it's important to find a tool or a system that actually lets you access uh, all those different browsers without dealing with the headache of maintaining that infrastructure. Um, and that's where we come into um, a cloud grid. So if you're running a Selenium grid locally or within your own organization, it works great, but requires a lot of um, maintenance always having to update browser versions, add new ones, 
switch out uh, mobile devices and new mobile devices whenever they're released every few months. <clears throat> um, and eventually that just becomes a lot to handle. Uh, if you're using a cloud grid instead, um, again, like browser stack, uh, suddenly you're outsourcing that maintenance and that infrastructure to you know, a remote organization that handles all that for you. Um, so by doing that, you will immediately have access to all the different OSs, browsers, and devices. I know with uh, Browser Stack, we offer back to Windows XP, so you can even test on really old uh, computers you may not be able to set up yourself anymore. You don't have, you don't have to set it up or maintain it. Um, and whenever new releases, particularly with phones, come out, they're automatically plugged in, and you won't have to source those phones, make sure everything works on them, add them to your uh, to your embed up to your environment or worry if you know so and so might drop it or that phone got lost or it's in a drawer or the battery died or the, the charger is no longer working you don't have to worry about any of those um, edge cases which is just a that's a big headache removed um, in addition to just having the access to the different browsers or os's or devices um, there are some additional benefits as well uh, most cloud providers are going to be adding um, additional logging options. So, you know, you'll increase options for, uh, you might have a video recording of the test as it happened. You might have additional logging um, for the JavaScript console or things like that, that can make your debugging a little bit easier. So you can actually enhance your debugging, even though you're using the same test scripts you might run locally. And uh, lastly, again, consistent across teams is really important. Um, that was already a benefit of using the Selenium grid internally. Um, but as teams get more distributed, um, it becomes even harder to do, especially when you start going across country or across countries um, like Browser Stack is, or if you are dealing with um, you know, cases like what the current environment where people start to work from home more readily and don't have access to uh, you know, something on network. Um, so it's just a great way to ensure consistency across all of your different teams um, and have whatever access you need whenever you need it. And um, with BrowseDeck in particular, uh, I am going to be going into, I'm going to be leaving our session next week where we'll go into more depth on how to use BrowseDeck. Um, so you know, once you have your first script up and running, how to adapt it to fit the BrowseDeck and run there and take advantage of all of the other options we have available. So that's something to keep in mind and hope we can see all of you there same time next week too. And that covers you know, all the things we want to talk about today. Um, just to quickly recap, um, and David walked us through how to get started with Selenium. Um, what is automation? Uh, how do you start, one, start up a session? Uh, how do you find elements, interact with them? And then we also talked a little bit about you know, things to consider when you start building out your suite and the challenges and benefits of that browser support and some of the tools you might use to do it like browser stack. Awesome. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Charlie and David. Uh, great introduction to Selenium and, you know, what we can do. And I think some great tips uh, from Charlie on, you know, how to choose a framework and a language, uh, some of the things that we should think about. Uh, we've got, I think, a lot of questions, 50 plus questions. So I'm going to try and sort of power through uh, some of these, uh, David and Charlie. Uh, I think the first one, it's, it's kind of an interesting existential question. Uh, somebody's asked, you know, what is Selenium? Is it a framework or a tool? And is, what's considered a framework and what's considered a tool? Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at the first part of that. So Selenium is a tool uh, in that it is used extensively for browser automation. Um, its biggest use case is testing, um, but it's designed purely to drive a browser. Uh, so that's why like people were like, when Simon created WebDriver, Simon Stewart that is, uh, it was about driving the web um, and not necessarily about testing. Um, sometimes it, people kind of uh, mix the two up uh, in that it's a, like, they consider it a framework. Um, and there are tools like webdriver.io which it makes it both a tool and a framework. Um, and I think um, like Charlie gave a really good explanation on kind of what a framework is earlier where it's, uh, um, 
I actually, I think I'll leave Charlie to kind of reiterate what he said, because he said it much better than I could. Yeah, so um, I would say the framework is just a, a way of organizing and structuring your tests all in one place. Uh, so you can have consistent, you know, logic, consistent configurations um, in one place. And then you can just plug in additional tests wherever you need to. Uh, so you can even think of it as just a, the organization around your repo. Um, but it's just a way to keep everything organized and ensure consistency across all of your tests. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question. So I think there are two, there's two parts to this question. Uh, the first one is if my organization only allows testing of builds inside of a VPN uh, or inside of a fire, you know, from behind a firewall, uh, how could I use some, uh, a platform like Browser Tank? And the second part of the question is if I am writing test scripts for uh, and using Chrome, uh, basically I'm using sort of the Chrome inspect element to identify the locators. Can I run the same tests on mobile devices? Will it work? So um, I'll certainly speak to the first one and then David, feel free to interrupt if you, if you need to. Um, that's a great question. BrowseStack does have a feature that specifically is designed to let you access and test your private environments on BrowseStack. It's called local testing. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more detail around that in our session next week when we really dive into how to use browser stack um, at first and then, you know, really efficiently. Uh, so we'll be able to get to it there, but it is possible using a custom browser stack feature called local testing. Um, and then the second question was around, uh, am I able to use desktop um, identifiers or desktop yes, or I, scripts if, if written I'm, for desktops? Correct. If I'm devices? using locators, uh, or using, you know, using Chrome, I'm identifying the locators, and then can I just run the same scripts that I've written using that uh, on mobile devices, just by changing the capabilities, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so with Browser Tech does let you do that. Um, it might be a little bit trickier to build it up yourself. Um, I'd say the biggest, uh, the biggest thing I've seen is if the website is a little bit different on a mobile screen as opposed to a desktop, if it's responsive at all. You need to make sure your script is uh, built to, a, to handle that. Um, maybe the nav bar at the top is uh, shrinks down into a hamburger icon or something similar. Uh, there might be cases like that you need to consider. So with Browse Stack, you certainly can take the same test and run it on a mobile device um, just by switching the capabilities. Uh, but there are some modifications you may need to make to make sure you run successfully there. And then if you're doing it internally, um, maybe, but maybe not, it depends on how you set it up. Go ahead. Just, just to add to that, like when Selenium looks for elements and then tries to interact with it, it will do its best guess at um, guessing if the element is actually visible. So like with Charlie, what Charlie was saying is if it shrinks down to a hamburger, the element might not be visible because they w there's something overlaying it and a, a normal person couldn't click it. They would have to do another step, which is click on the hamburger, then click on that. And so you, it's, you would just need to kind of be a bit aware of that, um, as Charlie was saying, when you're making those changes. And it's just because of that like visibility that it tries to guess. Great. Okay, I think the second, uh, sort of the, the next set of questions is around uh, to choosing the right language slash framework uh, when we're getting started with this, right? So I think the first one is, is there any diff any issue in terms of choosing a different language for your testing and a different language on which the application, through which the application has actually been built, right? So uh, different programming language for your test suite versus uh, the programming language that you're using for building the website. Any challenges yes. that you guys see there? That's a great question. Um, and strictly speaking, no, they do not need to be using the same language or the same tech stack. Um, and, but it does get into some question of who's gonna be writing the tests. Uh, some people have their developers write their same tests. Some people have separate uh, like developers versus testers. Um, I split that, that, that out. Um, if you have the same people writing it, I'd recommend using the same language. That way you're in the same ecosystem the whole time. If you have them separated out, uh, then you can pick whatever one makes the most sense for each individual team or, or individual uh, coder. 
um, but they can be independent. Um, that said, there are a couple instances where there are front end JavaScript frameworks that are designed to work with, or designed to work with um, testing frameworks. Um, so that's a lot of the node stuff. Um, for instance, Angular. Um, if you have an Angular website, there is a, a testing framework called Protractor, which is designed to inter designed to be embedded, you know, very closely there. Um, so it can appear, um, but strictly speaking, it is not required. Great. I think just a follow up question on frameworks. So. I'll you know, I think uh, Cucumber BDD is quite popular. I think people, uh, a few people have asked, you know, how, how successful or, or, you know, how, how, how much use have you seen uh, of Cucumber BDD on, on the Blush Tag platform uh, and sort of any general recommendations there? Got it. Um, so we, a lot of people do use it. Um, I think it, if, uh, with Cucumber in particular, um, there can be some challenges. It's because Cucumber um, and the way it, it parses like lang uh, verbal language into computer language um, doesn't always update at the same cadence that the, you know, they sort of independent, good independently from Cucumber versus uh, the different frameworks that you're using or different um, language or drivers you might be using. Um, so it can work really well, um, but there's another thing, you have a, a new layer to keep in mind when you're using it. Um, I've, uh, I'm not a, the biggest fan myself of Cucumber, um, but there are people on my team who have used it at their, in their past organizations who love it. Um, it's really a preference driven, I think, more than anything else. Um, and I know that we are uh, on the SE team at Browser right now, we're actually working on some examples of how to use Cucumber and Browser Stack and other frameworks as well uh, together you know, really, really well. And we're going to be having a um, those published just you know in GitHub as well coming up soon. Um, so it definitely works really well um, if you like it. Um, it's not everyone's cup of tea, um, but I, I would definitely recommend uh, researching it and seeing what's going to work for you. And if you do have um, both manual and automated tests working together, um, then it's definitely something to consider because you can write the same test uh, cases that both teams can use together. So. Um, depending on your use case, it might be a great fit. So it's def sure. definitely worth investigating. Great. Great, thanks, thanks, Charlie. I think, so the next question is very interesting. So I think, uh, you know, Charlie, when you talked about Selenium uh, and the Selenium grid uh, and sort of helping teams work, uh, collaborate and, you know, be able to scale their test suites to run on hundreds of browsers, right? I think uh, one of the listeners has a question around, how do you use, how do you eliminate this issue of, hey, it's working on my machine? when you're using the Selenium grid, right? Uh, because it's not your machine, right? It's running uh, remotely. Uh, and, you know, maybe you can talk about how you've seen this work at, you know, some of the other sort of large companies that you worked on uh, rolling rolling out test automation, uh, where you have teams of developers working together uh, on their test suites. Yeah. Um, well, the it works on my machine is definitely a, a sentence we've all said. And we've been on both sides of that. I'm, I'm sure, David, you've experienced plenty of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd say the best thing I can, the, the best thing I've done, or the, what I always do is try, at that point, try to find out what differences you possibly can and always reproduce it and get as close to a one-to-one -one recreation as you can of the other person's environment. Um, find out what their like what language version they're using, what framework version they're using, what Selenium version they're using, um, you know, which browser version. Um, you might find, you know, if it gets really complicated, you might find weird stuff in different like paths or something like that. Um, the only real way to, to get to the bottom of that is just to find what the differences between your environments are and then gradually try to remove the differences until the same thing happens. Got it. I, and just to add to that, like making sure you have um, like good uh, workspace uh, cleanliness and hygiene um, when setting up your like local environment, so that if you check out a brand new uh, check out your repository into a brand new directory, uh, it should work exactly the same on everyone's machine at the same time. And um, so, kind of making sure that like it, it, with um, 
Python or Ruby or kind of Java um, or .NET, like they've all got their own little like tools. So like NuGet, NuGet for .NET or uh, PIP for Python or um, Ruby Gems, like making sure everyone's on the same version and kind of making sure that's always set up and is always maintained. That stops. Um, ideally stops those scenarios and then uh, setting up your CI system to kind of use those tools, use like Ruby gems or PIP or anything to make sure everything's in the same state whenever the CI runs also checks that out so that uh, if it only works on your machine, like it's not going to work on anyone else's machine if it starts failing in the CI and they like you need to figure out why. Um, and just work through those. Uh, it's not fun and it's always a lot of hard work, but um, it's important for kind of good velocity of a team. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks, David and Charlie. I think, uh, David, question for you. Uh, I think uh, the Python example that you were walking through in the beginning, uh, the question is around, uh, did you need to run a separate sort of Selenium, uh, web dri Selenium driver executable or, or did the script sort of take care of all of that, you know, uh, in the background? Maybe you can just talk about how to set it up for the first one. Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, yes, you do need to download some, uh, something. So these are called um, driver executables. Um, so normally when you kind of go to uh, where wherever you will be downloading uh, for your favorite language, downloading Selenium, uh, it will give you references where you need it. So for uh, Firefox, you would need to download something called Gecko Driver. And uh, so you can, if you go to Mozilla's GitHub uh, organization, they will have a repository called Gecko Driver there. You download it. Uh, it does all the kind of heavy lifting. So like with Firefox, you need to make sure that there's a profile set up um, that the binaries can be found in the right place for Firefox and it takes care of that for you. Um, so that, and it's a lot of like heavy lifting. Uh, this one for Chrome driver, one for edge, uh, one for opera. Uh, and so you need to kind of have that, but then once you have that in place uh, and for the most part, it just needs to just sit somewhere on your, on your path. Uh, so if you've got it set up or just kind of, you can have uh, other mechanisms to, point Selenium to it uh, through arguments when starting up the browser. It will then start up that executable, which will then like tell the browser uh, to start up and to start communicating because each browser has got their own like internal funniness about how they communicate. Uh, and so you like that just handles it for us and Selenium has its kind of standard way of speaking and everyone like all the clients will speak that. So Ruby, .NET, mm -hmm. Python, Java, Node, um, they just speak kind of the Selenium version of that. Great, great, thanks, thanks David. So I think there are a couple more questions around uh, pop-ups in general. So I think one is around how do I, how do I handle the confirmation alerts, you know, JavaScript pop-ups uh, that might come up on, uh, you know, on my website. And the second one was around like sort of Windows, alerts or, or sort of, you know, OS level pop-ups uh, that, that, that are coming up. How do I, how could I handle that uh, during my automated tests? Um, so pop-ups are, so I'm going to start with the second one, um, if that's all right. So the, so the second one was, is there, uh, how, how does one handle uh, OS level uh, alerts? Unfortunately, Selenium cannot handle those alerts at all. Um, we are only in control of the operating system, uh, of the browser, not the operating system. And so we can't interact with things like that. Um, there are security reasons why we can't do that anyway. Um, and so like, um, like you would, that would need to be handled either manually or with other scripts to kind of handle that, unfortunately. Um, and to, to the, first question which was like you know if you have a, a prompt that comes up and alerts how, how does one handle that um, selenium has uh, a switch to api uh, and so switch to allows you to kind of switch between multiple different th like windows and kind of like i'm going to use the term windows very loosely here uh, and so these are like elements of the browser that are not um, kind of the actual page. So if you wanted to switch to a frame, you would use the switch to APIs. If you wanted to switch between a window or a tab, you would use that. There's a, also switch to uh, alerts. And once you're 
switch to that alert, you can either dismiss it or kind of handle it if it's a prompt. So it could be like, uh, please enter a number uh, for it and you would be able to interact with it and then either click OK or cancel or kind of, uh, if it's just an alert, you would only have the OK button and get rid of it. Um, you, alerts you have to always be aware of because in the browser, they will stop the browser from doing anything until that alert is handled. Um, it even stops all the kind of JavaScript in the background from running. Um, so whenever those come up, uh, you would need to handle it and just kind of ask, um, ask Selenium to kind of go do this thing for me and it will either find it for you and that's awesome and handle it or it might error. And so if it hasn't come up straight away, you might need to uh, use one of the advanced features that Charlie mentioned, which was the web driver wait or kind of other uh, explicit um, waiting techniques to find for that uh, alert to pop up. Great, great. Thanks, thanks, David. I think we are uh, officially out of time. So thank you, David and Charlie, for taking the time uh, to walk us through this. Uh, and, uh, you know, guys, uh, we will basically be covering the second episode uh, where, you know, Charlie will be talking about browser stack. So please do make sure, uh, you, you know, stay tuned for that. That's going to be next Friday uh, uh, on the 8th of May. So looking forward to seeing all of you there again. Uh, and we will share the recording of this webinar uh, with, uh, uh, you know, and we'll try to address some of the questions. I know we haven't had time to answer, I think, the 80 plus questions we've got today. So we try to address wow. some of these questions and follow it up in a, in a blog post. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, uh, Charlie and David, uh, for helping us out and, and for hosting this webinar. Really appreciate it. Thank you all for great. coming. Thank you Thanks all. Everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye.